Good morning, general chemistry students. It is so good to have you in lecture today. I am so excited. I am so thrilled. I am so privileged to have you as my students this semester. Just want to remind everyone before we begin, you are not alone. This is an academic community. Remember to get help when needed. Reach out to the university services if needed. Never give up. Keep trying. We are here to help you be ethical, intelligent, and successful scientists. However, at the end of the day, you must be responsible, ethical, and hardworking. So, just a quick um, shout out: the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given today to uh, some scientists. Uh, scientists were um, K. Barry Sharpless, who also won the prize in 2001, and also uh, Ms. Bertozzi. And the interesting thing about these, uh, the prize was uh, several interesting things, but what stood to me was it was awarded for the work that was done with click chemistry as well as with bioorthogonal reactions. So it's, it's a really good, good read, and I would recommend you go and look it up, research it, find out more about the scientists, where they work, scripts, and Stanford. So you may want to look it up. So as we do normally in this class, I want everyone to look at the structure of DNA. DNA is very important, very, very important, especially since most of my students um, vocalize that they are interested in healthcare careers. DNA is very important, a very important polymer to understand. Polymer made up of nucleic acids. A polymer made up of nucleotides, rather. And um, what we see, what the main questions I ask you typically are what atoms do you see? What functional groups do you see? And why is this molecule important? So I'm going to give you some time and I'll let you process it. Okay, so given that we have the annotation functionality in this uh, lecture to this today, I want you to look and see, As you, if you look and see, you have the amine functionality there. You also have, I'm going to introduce you all, you also have the phosphate group functionality there. You have the hydroxyl group functionality there. That's as far as I want to go with you all today. However, in terms of atoms, we see we have nitrogen, we have phosphorus, we also have carbon, those represented by the bends and endpoints right there and we also have oxygen and what else do we have we also have uh, nitrogen phosphorus carbon oxygen and we also have hydrogen those are the main things that we have um as we, we talk about importance dna is important for several things but we'll just mention that it's good for replication replication mm, let me draw it a little bit better replication Important for replication. Let me erase these things. So we already have those things. It's important for replication, and it's also important for um, proper gene expression. So the central dogma talks about DNA to mRNA to protein, and DNA is one of the pillars of the central dogma in, bio in biology. So it's very important, very very important. So let's keep going. Okay, this is just a more detailed overview of the structure of DNA. You see there's a 5 prime and a 3 prime, a 5 prime and a 3 prime, 5 prime and a 3 prime. Uh, we're not getting into that, just note it, keep it in your mind. Um, it's referring to the positions of uh, those carbons and don't, just don't worry about it, don't worry about it for now. Um, so... It gives it helps us to understand the directionality of DNA, especially when we're talking about replication and stuff like that. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's keep going. So a little bit about me, as I say typically in this class, I'm a value-driven individual who wants to make impact in society using scientific principles. My core values are respect, integrity, and excellence. So I expect you to demonstrate those every class and throughout the semester. I'm currently a junk faculty at the University of Bahamas, roles I've served in, 
graduate student, ACS Bridge Fellow, GEM Fellow, Podcaster, and author. So the objectives of this class. The goal of this class is to teach the chemistry content in an engaging manner that is relevant to the Bahamian student and digestible for their understanding. The sequence is as follows. Understand the fundamental concept. Practice problems relevant to, the, um, to, uh, to understanding that concept. Learn more nuanced details about each concept and practice more complex problems and integrate the details and the fundamental understanding. So, what we're going to delve deeper into today, I'm going to give you a quick review on atomic spectroscopy and then we're going to talk about chemical bonding. So, as we, as we do a quick overview, I want to go through these ideas and then we'll get into the ideas that we want to discuss that are more relevant to where we are in the semester. So as you can see here, the question comes to mind, why is the periodic table arranged this way? Why do we have these S and P's and D's and F's? So why do we have these S and P and D and F? Erase. So why do we have those things now? Those are those are designations that come from the angular momentum quantum number, or the Zimuthal quantum number. And L equals zero refers to S, L equals one refers to P, L equals two refers to D, L equals three it refers to F. And those give us an idea of the shape of the orbital. So we're not getting on back into what we already talked about. But we use these descriptors when we're writing electron configuration. So as we move along, depending on where we are on the periodic table, we are able to know what the electron configuration is for each element. And we discussed that already. So here we have a classic example. Let's look at sodium. So if you look at sodium, sodium's electron configuration is 1s2. So sodium, let me do a highlighter. Sodium. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, and if we go back, sodium will be 1s. Let me move this to the bottom. It's going to be sodium is going to be 1s. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. They're just reading it off, just reading it off. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, so I'm going back to the Broglie work with wave particle duality is very important in this class. The Broglie's work is applicable to all matter. It basically says that matter has both wave-like and particle-like properties. So let's delve into atomic spectroscopy. Let's delve deeper into it. Using quantum theory, we can explain the atomic spectra of atoms. Each wavelength in the emission spectra of an atom corresponds to an electron transition between quantum mechanical orbitals. So here we see an equation that helps us calculate the energy associated with the transitions. So creating a spectrum. A spectrum is produced when radiation from such sources is separated into its different components. Different components or different wavelength components. So a line spectrum. So the difference between a line spectrum and a continuous spectrum is that a line spectrum contains only specific wavelengths. So specific, let's remember that, specific wavelengths, and a continuous spectrum contains light of all wavelengths. So let me let me erase that before we proceed. Erase. There we go. So a line spectrum is a spectrum containing radiation of only specific wavelengths. A continuous spectrum contains light of all wavelengths. So the Bohr model. It was based on three postulates, and those postulates referred to certain radii corresponding to certain definite energies being permitted for the electron 
in the hydrogen atom. The printed orbit has specific energy and is in an allowed energy state. And energy is emitted or absorbed by the electron only as the electron changes from one allowed energy state to another. So, this is also a good point in the lecture to practice questions on Rayburg's equation. You will need that for the final. The Bohr model has limitations. It only explains the line spectrum of the hydrogen atom well, and it avoids the problem of a negatively charged electron falling into the nucleus. This is just a quick review. Now let's talk about chemical bonding. So I want you to think about four questions. What is bonding? Why is it important? What are the types? And what types of elements tend to participate in the different types of bonding? So bonding is a theoretical idea, and it involves the attraction of electrons of an atom to the nucleus of another atom. It is important because it provides a foundation for understanding chemical reactivity, and also is important because it is a means for elements to share, attract, or distribute electrons in order to become stable. So let, let, let's, let's look at that again. The foundation for chemical reactivity and then also it is a means for elements to share share, attract, or distribute electrons in order to become stable share, attract, or distribute electrons in order to become stable. There we go. Let's keep going. So there are three types of bonding. You have your covalent bonding. Which is the bonding between non-metals and non-metals. Covalent bonding exists in a spectrum in which you have non-polar covalent to polar covalent be able to assign assign things along that spectrum using the Pauling scale of electronegativity. Um, you also have ionic bonding, which occurs between non-metals and metals, between cations and anions. Ionic bonding is very specific. Um, you have your ions forming, coming together to form a crystal, a salt, some form of a compound. Bond, the bond arbor cycle gives an idea of how that takes place. Then you also have adhesive bond. Adhesive bonding, also known as coordinate covalent bonding. And coordinate covalent bonding occurs between metals and ligands. Classic examples. So, if you do more research, you'll see how these things make more sense. Okay, so let's talk about covalent bonding. It occurs when atoms share electrons as a means of bonding coming together to become stable. Uh, it typically occurs between non-metals. Ionic bonding occurs between metals and non-metals. This is binding or bonding rather between ions. It occurs between cations and anions. A classic example of this would be with sodium chloride. So say you have sodium. Let's see if we can do this a little bit better. So say you have sodium. Let's say sodium. And sodium. Let's oxidize to become sodium. Let's oxidize to become sodium cation. Sodium to become sodium cation. Let's say and, and, and then chlorine, let's reduce chlorine gas, let's reduce We have those things coming together. Now this typically takes place in a system like we well, sometimes it occurs. Um it occurs but typically occurs I want to write this down, I'll show this in a system like way. But given the time constraints in the lecture, I'm just gonna show that you have this these types of things coming together. Cat iron and an iron. 
Like the point on the cycle gives us an idea of how these things take place, in which you have the metal being ionized, and you also have the gas being ionized, and they come together to form a crystal analysis. So let me erase. Okay, so this quantum covalent bonding returns between elements and molecules, and metals and ligands. So let's talk about Lewis structures. The Lewis structure is based on the Lewis model and it helps us understand and make educated predictions about chemical observations. The valence bond theory provides a more quantum mechanical treatment of the electron, but not as they localize along the entire molecule. Molecular orbital theory provides a full quantum mechanical treatment of the molecule and its electrons as a whole. So the Lewis model is named after Gibbon Lewis, and the Lewis electron dot structures, the valence electrons are represented as dots with a chemical symbol to depict the molecules. So these rules, let's keep this in mind. Note the total amount of valence electrons. Let's keep this in mind. And we're going to refer to these, we're going to do a good bit of practicing in this lecture. And we're going to refer to these rules as we work through the lecture. Okay. Okay. Note the total amount of valence electrons place single bonds between each atom. Subtract two electrons based on the number of bonds added to electrons equals one bond. Ensure each atom has an octet. Exceptions occur with expanded octets for third period. Example include, examples include sulfur and arsenic. And then minimize charges. Okay. Bonding theories help us predict the circumstances under which bonds form. And also the properties of resultant molecules. Chemical bonds form because they lower the potential energy between the charged particles that compose the atoms. Metals and non-metals typically result in ionic bonds, which involves transfer of electrons. Non-metals and non-metals typically result in covalent bonds, which involves electrons being shared. Metals and metals typically result in metallic bonding, which involves electrons being formed. So we already discussed electron configuration. This is the bond arbor cycle I was referring to. It's important to remember that bond breaking is endothermic. It requires the input of energy. Bond forming is exothermic. It involves the release of energy. Bond arbor cycle involves the gaseous metal being formed from the solid metal. Molecules of halogen being formed from the atoms. Ionization of that metal and ionization of the gaseous chlorine, for example, and then formation of the crystalline solid. Lattice energy, so I'm going to touch on these things. You know, lattice energies become more ex less exothermic, rather, less negative with increasing ionic radius. We could go deep into that, but just know that for now. Lattice energies become more exothermic or more negative with increasing magnitude of ionic charge. 
Ionic compounds in medicine. So you have your fluorides in your toothpaste. Ionic compounds are used in medicine to strengthen teeth and even as antiseptic and disinfectant. So covalent bonds are very important. Um, the shared pair of electrons is called a bonding pair, while a pair associated with only one atom is called a lone pair. Exceptions Exceptions to the octet will occur with expanded octets in which there are 10 or 12 electrons surrounding the atom, and this is due to the d orbitals in these elements being energetically accessible and can accommodate the, ele the extra electrons. Expanded octets tend not to occur in second period elements. Also, incomplete octets were seen with boron and beryllium compounds. Okay. Binary compounds contain only two different elements. The names of binary ion compounds are written as such. The name of a cation, then you have the base name, the base name of the anion. For example, if we have chlorine, chlorine, and we have an ion compound that's made up of chlorine and sodium. I just have them in brackets full, just so you can see the separation. Uh, let me just draw these brackets just a little bit so you can see the separation. So we have that. And so, the name of the cat ion is going to be sodium. The name of the anion is going to be called, base name is chlor. And then you have your I, sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride. So you want to keep those things in mind. Let's see, I'm going to pick a race. Pick a race. Let's see. keep going. Now for molecular compounds you have your prefix, the name of your first element, then you have your prefix and base name of the second element. For example, dinitrogen monoxide, di nitrogen monoxide, carbon dioxide. Okay, these are some common uh, anions, polyatomic anions. Um, the ones I want you to really focus in on Common ones, sulfate, sulfite, that you have seen in BGCSC chemistry. <clears throat> also, you learn some cyanide, um, ammonia, phosphate, that's a common thing. Let me do that properly. Phosphate, there we go. Um, chromate, dichromate, um, bicarb. And carbonate. Uh, carbonate. Yeah. Um, there we go. So we have that. Those are the ones I want you to focus on. So let's do a quick erase. Okay, let's keep going. Resonance structures. Remember I gave you the analogy of the peach, nectarine, and plum? So we had the nectarine in the center. We had the plum on this side, and then we also had... Now, I adapt this analogy. Um, and then we had the peach. Peach, plum, nectarine. Now, these are not chemical... <laughs> formulas or chemical symbols because uh, uh, just bear with me for the analogy state, for the sake of the analogy um, you have your nectarine you have your plum you have your peach so the resonance hybrid is a best qualitative the best qualitative descriptor that we have to describe how the electrons are arranged or situated on the molecule
powerful. Um, lower cell electron dot structures are powerful when it comes to predicting things. Um, it gives us a good idea of what's taking place. Of course, you can do a little bit more with computational chemistry. However, resonance structures give us an idea of, uh, they allow us to account for the fact that electrons don't exist in one spot um, all the time. So, they give us an idea of the fact that electron clouds delocalize. But the main thing I want you to remember is the resonance structures just show where the electron doesn't be. They provide descriptions of where the electrons are. Um, when we have things like double bonds and single bonds existing in one molecule, we understand that electrons are delocalized. So it's important to be able to represent um, them as best as possible. And the hybrid is a general qualitative description of the position of the electrons in a molecule. Um, when you justify uh, bonding calculations and bonding degrees with like quantitative descriptions, that's a whole different discussion. But for now, let's keep this in mind. The description, the description of where things are in the molecule. So let's erase. erase. On the peach plum nectarine um, analogy, it's coming from the fact that um, nectarine is almost like a hybrid between a peach and a plum. So too is the resonance hybrid between different forms of different nose electron dot structures. Best resonance structure minimizes formal charge. And remember, we said that formal charge is based off of the fact that you subtract the bonding electrons and the non bonding electrons, half the number of bonding electrons minus the non bonding electrons from the total number of valence electrons. Another way to put that is you take the valence electrons and you subtract the dots. In the those electron dot structures plus the sticks and the sticks represent the bonding electrons Valence electron equals and that's equal that gives us an idea of the formal charge okay let's see let's see it's a race yeah it takes a while to really erase properly takes a while to erase properly. Um, so guys, I'm going to, um, the lecture is going to end soon. Um, however, I just want to erase and then we can keep going. Let's see, just erase. I'm going to do some structures, give you the solution to some of these. Those electron dot structures at the end of the packet. And then I will send you another video for you in which we discuss these things. So let's go. See. So let's go to the packet. Here we go. So this is what I wanted to get us to get to today. So I'm going to give you the lowest electron dot structures for all of these. Okay. So let's go. So let's go. So methane. H. So we accounted for the fact that it has. So actually. How do we do that? So the total number of valence electrons is going to be four plus four is eight. We represent we put single bonds between each atom. We have four single bonds. Each single bond represents two electrons because it's a bonding pair. Eight minus eight is zero. We don't have to worry about minimizing charges in this instance. Because the formal charge of every atom on this thing is zero. 
valence electron of hydrogen is one. Um, half the number of bonding electrons is going to give you one. There are no non-bonding electrons. There are no lone pairs on this thing. So you end up with a formal charge of zero for all of the hydrogens. And for carbon, you have four valence electrons minus the number of half the number of bonding electrons is four. Four minus four is zero. There are no lone pairs. Therefore, it has a formal charge of zero. So let's keep going. Um, I'm going to. Oops. Let me see. Let me erase that. Okay. So let's keep going. Let's look at. Oops. See if you can fix that. There we go. So let's look at war. Let's look at something that's a little bit more challenging. Let's look at. Um, let's look at. I'll do a couple easy ones first. So BF3. BF. F, there we go, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So, boron has 3, each of these have 7, 3 plus 7, plus 7, plus 7, equals 24, so 21 plus 3 is 24. We have 6 around each one, that's 18, plus another 6, plus another, so let's count this again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So that's uh, an example of the structure that we have for uh, boron trifluoride. And I will continue with this um, discussion a little bit later, um, but this is where we are for now. I plan to fill out this worksheet for you all um, on another video, but this is where we are for now. Keep practicing the problems, and the next video will be uploaded shortly. Okay, take care everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Good to see you all, and remember... You are responsible to be hardworking, ethical, and intelligent scientists. Good afternoon, students. We're going to be continuing with the lecture we just did previously. We're going to work through all of these questions on this worksheet. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so, before we do that, let's expand this. Okay, water. So we have water. Water structure for water is going to be. That, 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 so you have water, go through the process, write your structure, so let's keep going, keep going, CO2, Okay. Let's keep going. 
the video and rewatch it and go through the steps and see how I work these things out. Um, just using the steps, folks. Just using the steps. Carbon monoxide. Two, so two oxygen has twelve plus five is seventeen plus one is eighteen. So we have eighteen electrons total. So N, let's go in N O O one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. That's what I'm trying to do. Zero. That's that. That's minus. Minus. So that's not the correct. That's not the most be best descriptor. Best structure. So let's fix this. Put that. Put that. Structure. That has a formal charge, so that's going to be five minus five zero. Five zero. And this one has a formal charge of minus one. This oxygen right here. So it's going to be six minus seven. Dot plus six. One two three four five six dots. This one stick. So non-bonding electrons. Half number of bonding electrons. And you subtract some of those things from the valence electrons, you get minus one, so it's a strong charge of minus one, and the formal charge of this coincides with the charge of the polyatomic ion. So that's that. Okay, we're almost there. Let's keep going. Erase. Erase. Eraser. Let's see if I can erase this. Let's see. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Those three, we have that example in class. I will give you the many rest of the structures for this. Um, I'm going to give you the most common ones. So that, 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 and that. Because of its own pair, we'll get into molecular geometry later, or electron geometry later, molecular geometry, but we'll get into all that later. Structure for ammonia. So, ammonium. Let's 
C, if, this, if everything is zero, that, that one's zero, this one's minus one. So, you have to fix this. So, let's erase that. Let's erase that. Students have 18 electrons. This little stru structure should account for 18 electrons. O3. So let's look and see. 18. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So, 6, 3 is the 18. And let's see what are we missing. This has a formal charge of plus 2. This is not the structure, this is the form of it. But let's, let's fix the structure. Let's erase one of these. Let's, let's erase this and let's do it again. So, O, O, O. So you do a dot symbol. That, that. So let's see. So let's see if we move this. Formal charge. And, and. Let's see if we can put a triple bond between. Let me just make this clear. And. charge of plus one, this has a formal charge of minus one. So this is a good structure, because overall the formal charge is zero. And maybe a way, it's probably a way to draw this a little bit better, but this is what we're going to work with for now. Um, this has a formal charge of plus one, so let me highlight this, this oxygen here. Actually, let's a formal charge of positive one. This one over here has a formal charge of minus one. Um, when we look at the overall formal charge of this entire thing, it's zero. So we have minimized charge. Um, let's do um, xenon chloride and that will be the last example for today. Actually, do a quick one. Let's do one that's trigonal by prime. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Delta hexafluoride. Let's expand this more. 
Is this bigger? There we go. This, this is it. There we go. This alpha. Alpha six fluorine, each fluorine has seven, seven, these fours are hold on, one, two, three, four, five, seven fives are thirty-five, plus six is forty-one. So we have one, two, so you have six around each six dots, so six um pen sections that are represented in terms of the trend dot structure. Each fluorine, so six, one, two, three, four, five, thirty. So we're aiming for 41. So we have 30 dots. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 30. Let me make sure I count the things properly. So for fluorine, fluorine is a halogen. It has valence electrons 7, so it's just 7 times 6 is 42. So 40 is what we're aiming for. I, I misspoke. So 48 is what we're aiming for. Um, remember, sulfur is an expanded octet. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, I forgot. Let me see. 1, 2, 3. Oh, I forgot a sulfur. I mean, I forgot a fluorine. That's the reason why this. It looks like it's going to be octahedral, not triggered by parameter. That's the reason why I was trying it this way. It's not triggered by parameter. It is octahedral. So let me get my pen. So six, six times six is thirty-six. Thirty-six plus one, two, three, four, five, six. 36 plus 12 is 48. We have our structure. The electrons are counted for, and we have drawn it. So, guys, I know we went through a good bit of structures today. I hope you see that you can tackle these things if you're systematic and if you approach them correctly. If you know the valence electrons, if you put single bonds as a starter between each atom, if you fill in the electrons around the electronegative and then the central atom, and then minimize charges, you should be on your way to drawing good Lewis electron dot structures. Remember, the Lewis electron dot structures come from the Lewis model and they give us predictive power. So um, I hope you're doing well, um, and I hope you'll watch the first part of this lecture. This is part two, the practice portion. So take care, everyone.